Hello. Today I want to do a bit of a different video. I want to imagine that, for example, we're at one of these camps in the United States, maybe, maybe one called Arawara, I think they're Arawana, I think it is. Arawana, yes, it certainly sounds like something else. And at those camps, I reckon at night, you probably sit around and you probably tell stories. And I want to tell you a story, a real story that happened to me, because it's a story that I think is interesting today, especially today. It dates back to a time in 1995, and this is a time, some of you are going to find this amazing. In 1995, cameras only took photos, and your phone was attached via a wire to the wall. One of the interesting things about those cameras is they used to have a date function on them. Certainly the Nikon that I had, had a date function. And I'm very glad that it did, because it allows me to tell you this story, and I can, to the day, tell you what date these events happened on. So just to set the scene, over here, let's have a look where in the world I was. I was at a place called Morrow Airport, or Morrow Airfield, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. I was there doing an airborne geophysical survey. Here's a photo of me with the, um, the aircraft that I was on that survey with. That's an Aerostar, so that is Victor Hotel Whiskey Golf Kilo. That is an Aerostar. Um, that was um, a beautiful, beautiful aircraft to fly in. It was one of the fastest that we had. It absolutely used to just cut through the air like a razor. It was a beautiful, beautiful aircraft, and I, and I hope it still is. So I was in the highlands of Papua New Guinea in November 1995. Now this next photo is the real start of the story. So this is the 16th of October 1995, and here is me at the start of that day. So let me tell, tell you how we arrived at this photo here. As you've worked out by now, I like girls. I like girls a lot. And in 1995, I was really, really, really liking girls. But the thing about being in Papua New Guinea was, there was no girls around. It was just boys. It was also incredibly hot, incredibly humid, and that made it somewhat uncomfortable. And I'd always wondered, what would it be like to shave my head? And I figured, there's no girls around, there's no one to impress. I've always wondered what it would be like to shave my head. I'm gonna shave my head. So here's me at the start of that day. Here's me a little while longer when I was halfway done. And here's me right at the end, fully shaved. Now, I did it just because I wanted to find out what it would be like to have a shaved head. I had no other um, no other reason for doing it at that time. I was just curious to know what it would feel like to, um, to have a shaved head. I was immediately surprised by one feeling, and that is the feeling of being naked. I couldn't believe how naked I felt to be, uh, to, to have no hair on my head. It, it was, I had obviously been naked before, but it was a feeling of, of nakedity that I, I'd never experienced before. And something really unusual happened the next day that I want to tell you about. One of the local Papua New Guineans, a guy called Gabriel, he came up to me the next day and he said, Paul, are you okay? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fine. And he goes, but you've shaved your head. And I, and I said, yeah, yeah, I, I just was curious to know what it'd be like. So he said, so everything in your family, your family is okay. Everyone in your family is safe. And I said, yeah, yeah, what's, what's going on? And he says, oh, thank God, because in, in my culture, in, in all of the culture of all of the people's tribes here, when someone in your direct family passes away, you shave your head to show that, that you are in a mourning time and that, that you are in a time of sadness so that everyone around you knows to be gentle with you and, and care for you and, and treat you gently because you're very sensitive at that time. I said, oh, Gabriel, that is such a wonderful, wonderful um, cultural thing to do. I, I'm really pleased to hear that, but I must tell you, no one in my family has died. I, I'm fine. I just did it because I wanted to find out 
what it would feel like to, to not have hair. He says, oh, thank goodness, thank goodness. And I said, look, this is a lovely, this is a wonderful tradition that you have here. Western society could learn from this tradition that you have. And he says, oh, yes, and, and there is more. And I, I, said, I said, what's that? And he says, well, when your hair is gone, when you just have the skin, it means that the universe is giving you permission to cry and to be sad and to, to have all of these feelings of mourning. But your hair grows back. And as your hair grows back, it is the universe saying to you that life goes on and life must go on. And yes, you must mourn, but there must be an ending to your mourning. I was floored. It, it, it got to the heart of what it means to be human. And what I would say in, in general, having, having met those tribal peoples of, of Papua New Guinea, as a, and I'm going to say, as a dumb Westerner, you go there thinking that you've got all of the technology, you know, that you, you've, you know, you've got the aircraft and the helicopters and the magnetometers and, and, and you understand science and medicine. And these are tribal people that, that um, you know, have sugar palms and, and herd pigs. And yeah, very superficially, that is correct. But do not think for a minute that you are more human than them because you are not. They are are more human than you. They are more in touch with what it means to be human than, than you are. And you have much, much to learn by going and spending some time with them, as, as I did. So it stuck with me that when someone important in your life passes away, that shaving your head is a really intelligent thing to do. And in my case, being male, and, and, and I also, I, I had a receding hairline fairly early in life. It was not all that dramatic when two years later my father passed away and I did indeed shave my head for the reasons that Gabriel explained to me that day because I had had a, um, a passing in my direct family. And I did try and abide by the Papua New Guinean understanding of as your hair grows back, your morning time is over and then you continue and life goes on. As it turned out, I didn't get over my father's death that quickly or that easily or even by now, many, many years later. But I understood the concept and it stuck with me. So then last night, when I, as perhaps you, received the news that um, Sarah Pog has passed away, it occurred to me that it was my time to shave my head again. The time was now because I have lost someone that I care about. So I headed to the bathroom, I got out my clippers, I clipped my hair, and then I got in the shower, and I got a razor blade, and I shaved the rest of my hair off. So now I am shaved, and I am now in mourning for Sarah, as many of you will be as well. As I've said to you before, Sarah's situation and ultimately Sarah's passing is of particular significance to me because as far as I know, I do have terminal cancer. And when I look back on those um, images of, of Sarah from, from uh, a year ago, two years ago, when she looked actually quite healthy, it reminds me of when I look in the mirror now and I look quite healthy. And similarly, um, with, with Jenny Apple, there are photos of her from her early days where she looks absolutely normal. 
and yet we now know that, that she is actually um, very, very ill and, and terminally ill at that. And when I look in the mirror, I do see a predominantly healthy um, person that I do recognise as myself. I also see how thin I'm getting in my neck, how my um, cheeks are getting more sallow. And I do concern myself with, I may be terminal as Sarah was and as Jenny is. So it has special significance to me today and, and with, with Sarah's passing that I need to find acceptance in my heart that none of us get out of this alive. I am going to try and beat cancer. I do want to beat cancer and I might beat cancer. And I hope that I have I hope that I have more than a couple of years left to live. If I could, if I could wish for a number of years, I would say I, I, I hope I have five years. I hope I have five years left. So I'm 52 now. I hope I make it to 57. A bad case scenario for me would be that I have one year left, that I make it to 53, that I see 2024, and um, and that's it. I am aware that that is completely possible. Okay, I've run off on a tangent. I was actually going to do something else here. So I'm going to go back on, go back to where I was going to um, take, this, take the story. And I need to reposition myself because my butt muscles are starting to hurt. Here are some photos that I took in the days after I had, I shaved my head. Um, I, I want to show them to you to show that even though I shaved my head, not having had someone pass away, the fact is life did go on. There were things going on around me uh, and I did participate in them. And life does go on. Uh, for the Pog family, your life is going to go on. Uh, there will be obviously an, an, an acknowledgement of, of Sarah's contribution and there will be an ongoing, um, I think, positive legacy of, of Sarah's impact on the world. And uh, as I've indicated to the POGs, and I'll, I will repeat now, I'm absolutely happy to be part of whatever uh, future legacy you, you would like to go, go, go forward with, Josh. Uh, I, I, know we've, I know we've parked that idea for now, but um, at some time, we, let's revisit that and, and let, let's find something really positive that we can do. To, to remember Sarah well and and remember her in perpetuity, you know. They, they, they say that you have um, two actual dates of death. One is when your body ceases to breathe. The other is the last time that people remember your name. And if we do nothing else, let's make Sarah's second date of death way, way, way in the future. Let's do that, okay? So here's some, some pictures from Papua New Guinea of, of me uh, going through the, the village nearby. The village was called Minj, M-I-N-J. I met the, the elder. So um, this photo here is the grandfather of the, of the uh, tribe, of the village of Minj. I particularly liked having this photo taken because that gentleman there has a lot of facial features similar to my father. And I noticed that at the time and I wrote it on, on the photograph. I actually, I actually wrote down that this, this gentleman reminds me of my dad. And he has very similar glasses to my dad as well, but also just a similar smile, similar eyes. And this photo here that we took in a hut afterwards. So the reason there is that black strip at the top of, of this photo is because that's where the flash made it to. And this here is the writing that I wrote on the back of that, of that photograph. 
Then later on, we went for a walk through the forest and you'll notice that we made headdresses out of the, the, the forest uh, foliage. And I need to teach you a word of pigeon here. So pigeon is the Papua New Guinean uh, lingua franca. It's the, the common language that is spoken through Papua New Guinea. The word for hair, like the hair on your head, is grass. And the word for grass, like lawn, and bits of forest, like what I am putting on my head there, is grass. So literally, what you can see in these photos is me with grass in my grass. Okay, so I've got the forest in my hair. And the reason that they do that, well, certainly the way it affected me at the time was I immediately felt like I was part of the forest. I was no longer a stranger walking through the forest. I was of the forest in the forest. In other words, I was forest. And it was partly, I'm, I'm quite sure, absolutely, it was a psychological transition that I made because I could see in my peripheral vision these, these little bits of grass um, uh, from, from, my, from my headdress. It was absolutely lovely. This last picture here was one of the gentlemen uh, that was our guide. He stubbed his toe. And I had very wisely brought with me a Western Medic first aid kit. And in that first aid kit, I had, um, oops, I had uh, surgical spirits and I had um, you know, cotton buds and all of these things. What I didn't have at that time was a working knowledge of the pigeon language. I'm now reasonably good at, at speaking pigeon, but back then, back then I was still learning. And I was trying to express to this guy, this is gonna hurt. I'm about to put surgical spirits on a stub toe. This is gonna to hurt you. But I didn't know the words in pigeon. And I grabbed his hand and I looked in his eyes and I went, ooh, ooh. Like, like this is going to hurt. And I remember him looking at me and he, and he had a stern look on his, on his eyes, but, but he, he, he nodded and, and leaned forward and he was like, Ugh, okay. And so I grabbed his um, foot quite firmly and I rubbed the surgical spirit in and I could feel him tense up when he did that, but he didn't scream out. He didn't do anything to me to make him think anything other than it's okay, I understand. And it was one of those wonderful moments where verbal language has failed. You aren't able to speak English uh, and be understood by them, and um, they aren't able to speak pidgin and you have you understand it. So verbal language has failed, but non-verbal human communication has absolutely succeeded. You've absolutely had that moment where he understands this is going to hurt him. The the antiseptic is going to hurt, but I need him to ride through that pain. And he absolutely understood it in that moment. And that was just, just wonderful. I also want to show you what I wrote on the back of that photo, because it was one of those just funny moments of, of just when life happens. So here's what was written on the back of that photo. In essence, what happened was maybe 300 metres later, we're walking along and I'm feeling all proud of myself for having been, you know, effectively a good Western medic. And I looked down at this guy's toe and he'd grabbed like a really dirty piece of plastic and he'd just tied it in a knot around his toe. So I'd put the antiseptic on and I'd made it quite sterile and he'd then put a, a piece of dirty plastic um, around it. But that is, that is the reality of of um, the Papua New Guinean highlands. So I understood that and, and, and um, I think he was fine. Let's, let's put it that way. So that's my story about um, shaved heads and why I have a shaved head today. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is my shirt that I'm wearing today. I'll just, I think that'll probably have it in frame. Uh, this is actually a tarot card. Now, I'm not into tarot in any way at all, but I do like this tarot card. Um, the tarot card is called The Lovers, and it's tarot card number six. And my understanding of what it actually means in tarot is a time of change. And I thought that this was a really appropriate um, 
shirt to wear today. Firstly, because for the Pog family, it is a time of change. Today is undoubtedly a time of change for the whole Pog family. The second thing is, this is a very startling image. And startling because it combines a very strong image of death with a very strong image of love. And death, death and love are two very powerful emotions. And they're two emotions that really come to the forefront when someone you really care about passes away. And so I thought that today would be the day to wear this shirt uh, for the Pog family. So to Josh, Jared, Teresa, Brayden, Rayleigh and Amelia. I think I've got all of you. And 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 those are the those are the Pog family that I'm aware of. I'm, I know that there are cousins and, and aunties and uh, aunties and uncles and all the rest of you. To all of the Pog family, my thoughts are with you in this um, very difficult time for you. Um, I wish you all the love in the world. I'm sure all of my subscribers do too. And I, I hope that you find peace and love in this moment and um, and of course, be kind to one another and make good choices. Thank you. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.